The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we got a really special guest today. A really special guest from our hometown, San Francisco. We have Shoshana Ungerleiter, who is a physician and founder of Endwell. Welcome to the Jerry Pell podcast, Shoshana. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to, uh, it's great to see you uh, virtually here. <laughs> well, I am super excited because uh, Shoshana is one of the true leaders in our field of, of palliative care. And uh, despite actually not being a specialist in palliative care, I think a lot of us know her for the amazing things that she's done, including the Endwell conferences, a new conference that's coming up on December 10th called Take 10. We'll be talking all about that. But before we do, Shoshana, do you got a song request for Alex? I do. How about... Hmm. How about ride like the wind? <laughs> I love the way you make that sound spontaneous. <laughs> and Shoshana, do you have a reason why you chose that song? You know, I love yacht rock, that genre of music. <laughs> and when I think about that kind of era, I, that song always just like pops into my mind. It's just so fun and it's also hard to play. So I thought it'd be a fun challenge for <laughs> yeah, you. It, is. it really is more of like a full band sort of song. Although there is a, there are some nice acoustic versions on YouTube that I discovered. Were you going to choose like Come Sail Away? Was that another song on the list? <laughs> um, trying to think of all my yacht, yacht rock you, songs that I know. It's a good genre. Like anything by Hall and, o Hall and Oates, you know, Christopher Cross, Michael McDonald, Toto. Oh, yeah. Such good jams. Yeah. Well, thank you for this one. All right. Here's a little bit dropped an octave and with one guitar, not three. It is a night, my body's weak, I'm on the run, no time for sleep, I've got to ride, ride like the wind, to be free again, and I got such a long way to go, to make it to the border of Mexico, so I'll ride like the wind. Ride like the wind. Alex, if this whole palette of care geriatric things doesn't turn out, you can do a yacht rock tribute band. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> you know, um, I love it. <laughs> I uh, I was I coached my kids' soccer team for years, and my older kids' uh, soccer team for years. And I was so much shocked that the last year that I coached last year, they requested, uh, I always brought a speaker and the, they could, uh, you know, play different songs during warmups and they requested Yacht Rock like nine times out of 10. So, so it lives, Yacht Rock lives on with the younger generation. Who would have thought? Oh, I love a little, that. A little Christopher Cross there, That's Alex. Phenomenal. Cross. So Shoshana, I'm going to start off with how did you get interested in the topics of end of life care, palliative care? Because you haven't done a fellowship in palliative care, right? No, I'm a generalist. I'm, I'm a general internist. I sort of just uh, consider myself an evangelist for the field. I love it so much. So um, One of our biggest evangelists too. <laughs> it's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't know about that, but I, I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I did not get exposed to the field of palliative care in medical school. I trained from 06 to 2010, and it really wasn't until my first few months of, of intern year where I was spending my required rotations in the intensive care unit. And um, I, looking back, I think I was really struck by the number of uh, frail older adults that I was admitting into our ICU uh, day after day who had end stage whatever and were spending their final days and weeks, uh, moments of life really hidden away from their loved ones and, you know, re receiving very aggressive, invasive treatment when I knew that many of them weren't going to be helped by it. And we weren't 
asking them or talking with them and their families about what was going on day to day. And, you know, the expectations about getting better were not aligned, I often found. And I felt in, in many circumstances that we were prolonging suffering for people. That's not to say that I'm not a fan of intensive care. I think, you know, for, for many people, we save lives every day. And I'm so grateful for that, especially in, in the midst of, of the of the pandemic. But, um, you know, I just I realized that our healthcare system just isn't set up to be centered around what patients truly want. Um, and there's many, many reasons for that. But um, it, it got me interested in thinking about, you know, is there a better way to provide care for people? And I was lucky that I had amazing mentors in palliative care during my residency. And so I just, you know, sought out mentorship from them and realized that a, that an artful kind of skilled conversation with, with patients and families and the kind of symptom management that a palliative care team can provide is just as important as you know, coming in as a, as a cardiothoracic surgeon and performing uh, some major surgery, it's just as life changing for people. And so it really got me on, on this path to say, you know, everybody needs to know what palliative care is, needs to have as clinicians, some baseline competence in, in it. And of course the communication skills training that comes along. And uh, so that's kind of what I've, what I've set out to do over the last many years. Yeah. So going back, uh, were you around when Andrew Lasher and was that Linda Blum? Was Brad Stewart there too? Brad wasn't there, although I know Brad. No, Andrew Lasher and Linda Andrew Lasher. and Catherine Seeley. I mean, Andrew is really the reason why I got interested in palliative care. He was my interim program director, actually, uh, at the end of residency. And um, I, I sort of, when I see him around now, he's now gone to gone to Nashville. But um, I just say thank you so much. Um, all the work that I'm doing now is really because of him and his leadership and being such a wonderful mentor for me. And you started locally, right, um, as far as developing a, a local palliative care conference. I, I think I remember because I'm pretty sure I gave one of the talks there. Oh, was yeah. that part of it too? <laughs> You know, that was like a different thing. That was, you know, at, at Sutter, at CPMC, we, what we started was a, uh, a training program for the residents. Because like I said, I just felt like no matter what field of medicine you're going into, uh, you, you really should have a baseline understanding of, of what palliative care is um, and then uh, some, some communication skills training. So there at, at CPMC, we started the program for all the residents from day one of internship. They got this required rotation uh, every year. And so as part of that, we started a community education series where we thought actually more clinicians would show up for it, which, which both of you have, have spoken at actually over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out not that many clinicians come and it's mostly just interested community members, which has been Interesting. fascinating to me. Um, we haven't done it during the pandemic, but you know, we would have hundreds of people show up for these evening, these quarterly evening sessions. And so that was my hmm. first idea in thinking about how do we engage the general public really in, in conversation uh, around some of these hard subjects. And it really got me thinking about, you know, how do we shift culture? right? In, in the many ways that that can happen. And I obviously know that's a really, you know, large goal. And I had an opportunity actually to spend some time um, with a design firm locally, IDEO, where we worked on this design challenge. And we asked the question, you know, how can we, how can we reimagine or redesign uh, the end of life experience for patients and families? And through that really incredible few months, I realized that, you know, these are topics that aren't just relegated to the medical realm. I mean, the, the serious illness, caregiving, the end of life, grief and loss. I mean, these are part of the human journey and we need more humans involved in, in these conversations to come up with new solutions uh, to make the experience better for everybody. And so I had gone to a lot of conferences around the country that first few years after residency, because I was like, oh my God, I have all this time on my hands now. And I realized that we do a lot of preaching to the choir, you know, about how things need to change and how, you know, we can shift healthcare and, and care for our patients and their families. 
But I realize we need to lower the barriers to entry too, that in, in order to really think globally about this um, on a societal level, we need to invite more people into this conversation. And so that's how Endwell was born. We actually thought of ourselves as like a, an end of life design conference. And that was back in 2017. So we've, we've come a long way from that. And uh, that first year we, I sort of called up a bunch of my friends and said, Hey, will you speak at this conference? It's about end of life, but it's not a medical conference. Uh, and people gave me really weird looks and we really weren't sure if anyone was going to show up. <laughs> and that first year we sold out three months in advance, Wow! hundreds of people on our waiting list to come. Wow. And we've just really grown it from there and have become more of a media platform where we create content on stage um, that's TED style, as you know, and put it out on social media. And we have tens of millions of views of our content every year. And people wow. engage from all over the world in conversations mm -hmm. that they maybe otherwise wouldn't be having. So it's been a really interesting you know, evolution of, of the event itself. So much gratitude to you for um, taking this mission on and uh, and hosting such a conference that has you know surpassed all expectations. <laughs> Could you share with our listeners uh, who are mostly clinicians who are caring for older adults and people who are uh, seriously ill near the end of life? Who is this conference for, and um, what what would you say this conference is about? Well, so we've actually kind of transitioned into something different this year. And so Endwell realized really early on, probably in April, that we couldn't have an in-person event safely. And now that's even more apparent uh, given that it's November. So we transitioned to a virtual experience called Take 10. So this year it is free. Um, it's on December 10th and features celebrities and everyday heroes. Um, the idea being that we wanted to bring together community really in solid with our frontline healthcare workers, caregivers, those experiencing social isolation, um, people facing grief, and those living with serious illness to really provide a forum for the end of the year uh, to connect and to process our collective experience uh, in the midst of, of COVID-19. So this year, it's a four-hour virtual experience that uh, will have solo talks, performances, conversations. And it was really important to us um, that talking about the fact that these really aren't ordinary times, right? We all know that. So, so sharing more about the importance of caregiving, about grief and loss, illness, the end of life, I think are harder in a lot of ways given COVID, but more urgent than ever before. And so the event itself is is free and open to the general public. And we have a number of amazing uh, speakers confirmed that I'm super excited about. Yeah, the lineup looks absolutely amazing so far. The ones that you've announced, Maria Shriver, is that right? And Atul Gawande and other, like Andy Cohen. How did you select who is going to be part of the lineup? Well, it's been an interesting, interesting process. It's a little bit of like who's available and who's interested, but we, our team spends like at least three months out of the year doing curation for the event, whether it's an in-person one or a virtual one. We think that content is so, so important and, and to choose the people, both celebrities as well as people who are less well-known, but doing amazing work in their fields. Um, and to choose them really carefully and think about what they're talking about and in what ways. So like Soledad O'Brien from, from HBO and CNN is our host. Um, Taraji P. Henson is talking about mental health for communities of color and her work uh, of her um, Henson Foundation in terms of destigmatizing mental health um, in black communities. Um, Atul Gawande is gonna be talking about being mortal in the setting of COVID-19. You know, Andy Cohen, who I'm a big fan of because I love reality TV, he's going to be talking about men supporting other men through times of grief. Um, we think that that's a really important subject right now. Maria Shriver, who you mentioned, she's done a lot of work with Alzheimer's, but then also, of course, in her own life has faced so much uh, loss. And so she is talking in, she's having a conversation with Claire Bidwell-Smith about creating a new language uh, to talk about grief and loss in, in the midst of uh, COVID-19. And people like Blair Underwood, 
is a family caregiver, but from afar. He lives in Los Angeles and his mother and father, his mother who just died, live in Virginia. And so the, the issues around caregiving at a distance. So, and then a number of people like, you know, Nahid Dosani, who's Canadian, but does palliative care for, for homeless populations. And uh, Maya Scott, who's a social worker um, who lost her own child very, very young and, and now is a palliative care social worker talking about caring for young people who are dying and listening to children and and their wishes around the end of life. So it's going to be just like, I'm, I'm super excited about the day and how it's all coming together. It's obviously a very different format being virtual, but um, we've built this custom uh, online platform. So it looks and feels a lot like Netflix. So this is not just another Zoom webinar. This is something very different, immersive, uh, and holistic in terms of thinking about, you know, how we, how we go from topic to topic and speaker to speaker. So I encourage everybody to, to check it out and uh, tune in on December 10th. So we'll have the, the link to the, uh, end well take 10 website where to register. It's December 10th. Shoshana, let's say everybody in the U S listens. What are you hoping will happen on December 11th? Like what's mm-hmm. your what's your hope for this, your goal for this type of event? Yeah, it's a great question. This year is a little a little unique and and the title Take 10 uh actually came from the fact that it's December 10th, but also the idea that we're encouraging people to take 10 minutes. So start with just 10 minutes out of your day to first reflect on your own life what matters to you, and then think about the end of it and talk with the people that you love uh, about it. So, you know, I, I really think that that COVID has shown all of us just how fragile life is, that tomorrow is never a given no matter how old you are, right? And so this, this feeling of our own shared mortality, I, t- from my perspective, is more palpable than ever before. And so the importance of number one, talking about the hard stuff in life. Well, first thinking about it, but then talking about it and then sharing it with the people that you love um, is is so important um, and so urgent. And so my hope is that people feel moved and inspired and then motivated to, if they haven't already had a conversation with, with their loved ones about what matters most to them in their life and then um, and and chat about it during the holidays we see with the pandemic is is raging on here and uh, you know wh- whether the end of someone's life is is near or far away we we know these conversations are so so important um, and and really integral to be having throughout life not just in a, in a moment of crisis. And so that's, that's what I hope. And I, and I really do hope that everybody in America hears about this and and tunes in. That was my goal this year. Terrific. You know, some people's work is aimed primarily at clinicians, some at, uh, your work is aimed at some at healthcare policy makers. Your work is primarily aimed at, my understanding is primarily aimed at everybody. (laughs) <laughs> like people, uh, we would call them patients as clinicians, but they're people. Yeah. Uh, is that sort of your target audience for this conference? And is that different from prior years with the in-person and well conference? You know, it's always been uh, a, a focus on a general audience. I think we, what I wanted to do was take this out of just being in the healthcare or the medical realm and really use language that wasn't medical. So we don't, typically talk about things in terms of geriatrics or palliative care, or sometimes we say serious illness, that's sort of a medical term, but we, we really, again, wanted to make this content as accessible as possible to anyone and everyone. Cause you could make the argument, right? That we're all going to be patients at some point in our lives. We'll all be caregivers. We will all face illness, either our own or of someone we love. And so this is really about the human journey. And um, that's not to say that healthcare doesn't play a huge role or that policy doesn't, you know, dictate many things, but that those are just pieces of it. And so this year in particular, we, we really wanted to make sure that this content was free, was accessible to everybody and really truly lower those barriers to entry for folks. And that's what Endwell will continue to do is really mm-hmm. um, think about how to normalize these, these topics and these conversations mm-hmm. for everyone. 
I wanted to ask also about another component of Endwell, and I presume t- Take 10, is that there's this interest in uh, bringing together uh, innovators and people who are in business uh, with people who are more in the healthcare space or providers or um, who are trying to you know stimulate conversations around advanced care planning, end of life. And uh, so that there's that um, sort of blending of the private foundations or enterprises rather with this public mission. Um, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit more and why uh, you think Endwell is particularly suited to that focus. That's a great question. I think partially because we're based, you know, in San Francisco, so near Silicon Valley, my husband's an entrepreneur. So I always got thinking about, you know, how can we encourage smart, thoughtful people who know how to build companies that solve real problems, how do we bring them into this conversation, right? I mean, not that there hasn't been over the years, many, many companies in this space, but how do we encourage more people uh, to get interested and then more investment dollars to flow into, into these companies? I mean, I always think about the fact that at the other end of the spectrum of life, right? When, when pregnant women are having babies or you have a newborn, the number of products and services and, you know, entities that exist on the market in order to support, you know, pregnancy, labor, birthing, teething, feeding, bathing. I mean, you name it, right? It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the other end of, of life, um, the more kind of advanced aging and end of life space, there aren't many products that that come to mind, right? It, this is not an area of which there has been much interest in investment. And there's so many reasons for that, right? We could talk all day about why societally we don't honor and, and value the end of life. Um, there's also, it's hard to figure out who's going to pay for that stuff when people are on a fixed income. I mean, all those things are part of it. But I think that we as a as a society should be valuing uh, this period of time. And one piece of that puzzle is just in encouraging more thoughtful innovation in the space, um, because I do think that mm-hmm. we can make this experience so much better for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wanted to fo- pick up on that thread just a little bit and that there's been some tension, I would say, within the palliative care community on the extent to which we should focus on care at the end of life or end of life care, or even use, for example, the term uh, that, that the term end well, for example, might uh, be criticized for, from some. Mm-hmm. And maybe you could just say, well, this is sort of an academic issue to the lay public. Palliative care is end of life care. Let's start with uh, let's start with end of life care and that we do need to have conversations about the end of life. But there's also this risk that, uh, you know, very reasonable perspective that if we associate palliative care with just end of life care, then we're shortchanging what it is we do as a field. And I recognize that you're not trying to promote palliative care. You're trying to promote these conversations and end well. I'm trying to put it into, you know, clinical terms our, our audience would understand. Uh, but I wonder if you've engaged at all in this uh, this sort of debate about... Uh, or, or if you had um, any pushback from people or um, second thoughts about using the term end well or focusing on end of life in particular? Yeah, great, great questions. This is such an important conversation and the debate I find really interesting. You know, as somebody who's sort of an outsider to the field, I have, of course, you know, heard about this and, and been involved in a few conversations. And I, and I do think it is important to be careful about language, um, especially when we are talking about it from an academic, you know, perspective. And if we're talking about just within medicine, being clear about what it is that palliative care is and does, what is hospice and, you know, what it, what it does. Um, And so I think that the biggest difference um, for us is that, you know, we aren't a a medical conference. I I am a doctor, but, um, you know, I'm the only doctor on our entire team. And uh, and so we think about this in terms of focusing on what the general public really cares about. And, And from my perspective, they just care about the experience and the care that they're getting. Mm -hmm. Um, What it's called is really up to us Mm -hmm. and thinking about if we need to shift how systems, how 
you know, hospitals and other entities um, think about referring to palliative care or not, I think that that's a different conversation. I am always a real stickler with our team and with anything that we're a part of in saying that when we're going to use the words palliative care, let's be very specific about what palliative care is. It is care for anyone facing uh, serious illness and their families. It can be used at any time during the course of illness, ideally at the time of a serious illness diagnosis. I Believe me, I hammer that home every single day with our That's team. Yeah, so I think right. it is incredibly important to be thoughtful when we are using those more clinical terms to be very specific. But in terms of thinking about ending well, you know, I think that that's something that everybody wants for whatever that looks like for them. And so I'm interested, I'm excited to see where this, this conversation ends up, uh, in terms of thinking about, you know, how do we use, uh, the, the words palliative care going forward? Cause I do think language is very important. Now, can you also tell me, so you, you've been a part of two Academy nominated, uh, documentaries. H- how did that fit in um, I think one of them was ex- Extremists, right? With Jessica Zitter, who we had on our uh, show, I think a couple years ago. And the other one was blanking on the name. Uh, hey, it was even shot at UCSF. I um, know no, it was. Uh, um, it's Endgame. Endgame. That's it. Opened up yeah. with Steve. How does that fit into the whole picture? Yeah. So I think for me, like the, the big, the big idea for me is that I, you know, I believe that culturally we don't value the latter stages of life as we do say the beginning of life. As I said, you know, I I think that people who are of older age or near the end of their lives are hidden away in institutions. Therefore we aren't thinking about and talking about and planning for illness and the end of life. In America, I'll say. In medicine, we're, of course, everyone knows we're incentivized to do things to people to provide more aggressive treatment. And we aren't really taught how to first ask people what matters to them in their own life and then say, how can I optimize the care that I'm going to give you to best deliver that for you? Um, I think that's slowly changing. But I I also think, and I, I promise I'm getting to my answer, I think there's an awareness gap. I think that You know, most people who have not worked in healthcare or faced a serious illness in their own lives don't realize that by default, if you become, you know, acutely ill, you'll end up in an ICU unless you opt out loudly and you'll get very aggressive invasive treatment and that our healthcare system really isn't set up to be patient centered and communicate with you um, about what you want. So that's why... I've gotten interested in in film, really, and and all the other work that I'm doing in in order to um, shine light in some of these uh, hidden places, like the intensive care unit, like a a hospice-type facility, like, you know, a hospital, because I think that we need to create more awareness so that people can know that they have to advocate for themselves and how to do that in the moments when it really matters. And so I think part of that is educating the public about what palliative care is, that they need to ask for it if it has not been you know, readily offered, um, what hospice is. And again, this default that, you know, unless you really opt out loudly or have a healthcare proxy speaking for you, you will get very aggressive invasive treatment potentially near the end of your life. And so these film projects really fell in my lap. I have no background in film. It just so happened that, you know, I was friends with, with Jessica and we were chatting one day and uh, they'd spent months filming in the ICU over at Highland and I called up the director because I was like, hey, what what is this film that you've been working on? And he sent me about a five-minute rough cut. And I remember because I was on call, I was at the hospital working the night shift, and I watched it on my phone. <laughs> and uh, I was just totally floored by what he had captured in just four or five minutes of footage of, of real families, you know, patients intubated or talking with loved ones about, you know, uh, the serious illness that they were, that they were facing in the ICU. And uh, it brought me to tears and I am not an emotional person. And so I said, my goodness, there's something here. I think this, you know, more people need to see this and understand why this is important to, to watch something like this. And, uh, 
so I called him up the next day and I just said, Hey, like, I'd love to help with this project. What, what does that even mean? What could this look like? And he said, well, we need money. Uh, we need to figure out how to get it out to the world. And I said, Hey, I'm in. And I really thought that the film would maybe live online at the New York times or something. And we just got super duper lucky that Netflix got in the business of short documentaries that year. And we were the first one they ever bought. And then we premiered at Tribeca and then we won Tribeca. And that's when I was like, huh, I guess this is like a real movie. Like this is super cool. And then with the Academy Award nomination, I literally was like, I don't even, yeah, it still like blows my mind that that happened. And then to get involved with Endgame, which is a totally different team and a very different story to have that happen again. I just was like, what? Like it's, it's still like completely mind blowing to me that those you know, projects came together in the way that they did. And the teams that really did the work were just so phenomenal. I I really just played a supporting role, but I'm super proud of them. And uh, it shows me that there's a different kind of appetite, I think, out there for um, telling these stories and to be talking about some of this hard stuff that we do with with Endwell. And so I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah. So hopefully a different different culture around listening to these stories too, which is, you know, what you're trying to do is a lot of cultural change about end of life care and making it part of a a, a natural discussion. You know, one worry is like the healthcare system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets, right? So even if there's a cultural change, even if people make, you know, discussions around it, there's pretty good evidence that it's less about what people's preferences are. It's more about the hospital they get admitted to, where they live in the US, what kind of insurance that they have. Like those factors dictate what end of life care looks like. And how much do you think actually a change in culture can actually change what what end of life care looks like to people? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think these are really important things to think about and talk about. So, you know, I think from a couple of perspectives, I think number one, we've all just gone through, you know, the election, right? Um, we hopefully all all voted and and made our made our voices heard. And so, you know, I think about it, you know, getting back to this idea of how policy can shift how decisions are made. And um, I think on one level, you know, from a cultural perspective, if people are much more attuned to conversations about about caregiving, about, you know, hospice about palliative care, we are more likely to put people in office who also are advocating for these things and talking about these things. Now that's a many, 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 you know, year or potentially generations process of thinking about this. But I I think that there is, you know, a, a huge cultural element to, you know, opening the door to these kinds of conversations. Um, because we know that policy drives decision making in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, to, to your point about conversations around preferences and wishes around the end of life, you know, um, I, I'm definitely not an expert and I, you know, don't review this, these data, you know, day in and day out. I know there's been some interesting um, studies that have come out, but I do think that there is something to be said for the importance of, you know, consumer demand, right? So if you are a person facing serious illness, if you're supporting a family member in that scenario, um, and your clinician doesn't readily say to you, Hey, you could really benefit from palliative care. Let me make that referral. You know, it's, it's often on, on you, right. To say, Hey, I know about this thing called palliative care. Um, could I talk with somebody about this? What is that? Would it be appropriate for me right now? So I, I do think that, and I mean, I think you both would hopefully agree with me that that's important. And that sometimes it does take, you know, the the family or the patient advocating um, to receive care that's in line with your goals and your values alongside curative treatment, right? So I think that, and and those kinds of things come with with the shift in awareness and shift in culture about um, talking about this stuff. So... You know, one of the things is you're you're right now talking to the choir. Like our our listeners are the choir. Is there something? Like, and you are one of the the kind of leading advocates right now for improving end of life care, changing the culture for palliative care. Is there something that you wish that the choir would do more of to help change the culture? Hmm, that's a great question. Eric, I'm just going to clarify that. So you mean like the clinicians who are listening to this podcast who care for older adults or people living with serious illness, is there something that they could do 
either in their clinical practice or as public citizens and advocates in a position of power being, you know, physicians or nurses or social workers. And I'm like, I love, I just love how you put yourself out there. Like you are not, at least it doesn't look like you're scared of putting yourself out there. And it even shows with COVID. I mean, I, I see you all around the news right now. Mm-hmm. Well, well, tell me this, what's there to be scared of, right? Like I, to me, it's like, if, if I can use my, my spare time to do something that I think helps people and, and pushes the needle um, for such a critical set of conversations, I'm going to do it. Um, I'm super lucky and that I have the time and the resources right now to be able to do that. I don't even know that I would ask people who are working day and day and night, taking care of, of, of folks to do more than they're already doing. My goodness, you guys are slammed, especially right now. So, I mean, I think just the one thing I would say is take care of yourself. This is such an insanely, uh, unimaginably hard time right now. I think doing the things, you know, to nurture your own soul during this incredibly hard time is is really the critical thing so that, so that you can show up at work every day and best take care of folks yeah, I, I think, I mean, those are the things that come to mind for me. I, I want to do a quick lightning round here. Okay. Um, so uh, you've had a number of terrific uh, speakers over the years at Endwell. Can you tell us about uh, one or two of your favorites and why they were your favorites? Like something that, uh, you know, just really sticks out for you uh, among all of the amazing experiences that I'm sure stick out for you. Yeah. I mean, getting to interview Tim McGraw on stage, he's one of my favorite singers. That was pretty great. He was just so real and talked all about the experience of being a caregiver and the importance of palliative care for his own family. That's number one. I think hearing Megan McCain last year talk so candidly. I mean, she was just so raw on stage talking about the death of her father, Senator John McCain, and how messy and hard grief Mm. often is. She then the next day on The View mentioned how moved she was by Endwell, which was like, Mm. whoa, like she really was. Esther Perel last year talked about relationships and intimacy for people facing serious illness. And that talk like completely blew my mind because she brought up. I love her podcast. Yeah. I mean, she's, she has like two (laughs) amazing podcasts. I mean, she's just a total genius. She talked about things I had never considered. Um, And now she's hosting an entire international workshop, actually this last month on the importance of talking about the end of life experience, which Mm -hmm. she says Endwell opened her eyes to. She, before, before coming to Endwell and speaking, she was just too scared being the, being the child of Holocaust cost survivors to to think about this stuff and talk about it openly. So this is what we set out to do, right? Endwell wants to normalize these hard conversations, transform how we think about it, how we talk about it, and then ultimately experience these things in life. And so seeing people like these who are some of the drivers of culture in our society being shepherds of this is really, really powerful for me. And uh, I'm Again, like I, I feel like we're, we're, I'm encouraged by where we're headed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, two more lightning round questions. Um, one is, um, what's the financial model for Endwell, and how do you what What's the sustainability? Like, how do you keep this going? You know. <sighs> Were you a fly on the wall during our meeting today? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. So we're a nonprofit. So mm-hmm. uh, just to be totally transparent, I have never paid myself a penny. Uh, I, I do this work because I, it's, you know, Endwell is my baby and I, um, I want to see it grow and flourish. So um, we essentially, you know, in a normal year, we make, we make some revenue off ticket sales. That's why we charge, unfortunately, is because we have to keep the doors open. Uh, we're a completely remote team. So I joke, we don't really have doors. But this year, we, we largely are relying on the amazing support of our major donors, so philanthropic mm-hmm. institutions, corporate sponsors who wanted to get behind this message, and then individual donors. So whenever I send out an email asking, you know, can you donate ten dollars? We actually really need it. Um, we we sort of we try to break even every year and, and stay solvent, but it's uh, it's a challenge, and COVID has really made that all the more difficult, um, given that philanthropy is right up and the economy mm-hmm. is, is strained. So we, we just do the yeah. best we can. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question. You have had some amazing uh, guests and speakers. We would love to have them on Jerry Powell. Do you have any tips for us on how we, uh, how we get some of these amazing people to be on our podcast? Or for our listeners who are also doing this in their own different ways. Well... 
I mean, have you asked them? Like, who do, who do you no. want? <laughs> I guess it's, you know, I mean, what's, what's amazing no. to me is the number of, I've you know, I send so many cold emails to like celebrities yeah. and famous scientists and writers where like, they don't know me from anything. And they write back and they say, wow, this is so important. I will do it for you and I'll do it for free. So it's, I mean, it's incredible to me what can happen when you just put yourself out there and ask. Um, that said, if there's anybody that, you know, we, that we've had at Endwell that you're interested in, let me know. I'm happy to make introductions. Um, I think this year, different than other years, people are at home kind of twiddling their thumbs trying to get by because, you know, hopefully, you know, people aren't, aren't uh, traveling and doing things. Um, the entertainment industry is still largely shut down, um, as is, you know, music and all those. So it's, it's easier to get to people, but that'll probably change once, uh, once we get COVID sorted out. Yeah. We're all spending less time on our yachts. <laughs> that was the transition for Alex <laughs> or, or my imaginary yacht where I listened to Christopher Cross, but this is not Christopher Cross. <laughs> It is Christopher Cross. It is Christopher Cross. Oh. Yeah. I think. Yeah. It is Christopher Cross. Ah, oh, see, that's my knowledge about Yacht Rock. All I know, he did sailing, right? Sailing. <laughs> Takes me away. <laughs> Take it away, Eric. <laughs> I was born the son of a lawless man. I always spoke my mind. With a gun in my hand, live nine lives. Gun down ten, gonna ride like the wind. And I've got such a long way to go to make it to the border of Mexico. So I'll ride like the wind, ride like the wind. Awesome, Alex. I would have preferred you yeah. doing sailing next time. You got to take us out. <laughs> next time we'll have some Mai Tais. Shoshana, a very big thank you for joining us. And to all of our listeners, December 10th, please register right now. We'll have the links to uh, on our Jerry Pal website. Shoshana, you want to just throw out the URL that they can go to too? Yeah, endwellproject.org. We hope to see you there. Great. And a big thank you again for joining us today, Shoshana. Thank you so much for having me. And to Artstone Foundation for your continued support. And to all of our listeners, thank you for um, supporting the Jerry Powell podcast. If you have a moment, please rate us on iTunes or your favorite app and throw in a comment. Comments are a great way to actually start spreading the news about Jerry Powell. Good night, everybody.